，真，我是真真感动，讲这个接换吼，啊，拜六暗时大家食饱饱，啊，佫伫家留留伫家听听咱这个哦，这个节目吼，所以真感谢大家，吼、哦，啊，请大家卖度孤，因为我知影今仔日下晡大家已经困过啦，吼、哦，所以，所以，诶、呃。啊，阮即马诶，第一个节目是含我含 Kevin Lin， 啊，这个节目吼，那、啊、是希望讲大家呃见谅吼，我用英语，好、啊，我即马都会用英语来介绍这个 Kevin 或者朋友。So I want to switch uh switch over to English. Um, I'm going going to have this talk with Kevin uh in English. Um, very very honored and privileged um to introduce my friend Kevin um who as Most of you know is the COO of Twitch and one of the founding、uh, members of、uh, the company. Now,、uh, most of you guys probably know what Twitch is.、Um, who here plays video games? Okay, I know.、Um, I know a lot more of you play video games probably on your cell phones or your iPads that your children gave you.、Um, But if you're interested in watching other people play video games, that's where Twitch comes in.、Uh, so Twitch is a service where people live stream and、um, show other people、uh, when they play games, and other people can watch and talk and、uh, get to know each other and connect.、Um, so that's what he does. But before Twitch,、um, Kevin was also I know Kevin from working on the Intercollegiate Taiwanese American Students Association. Together, and you know that we actually did it because we can say that really long name really fast.、Um, oh, right, so I you know done it a little bit more, but、um, you know Kevin has been involved with、um, the Taiwanese、uh, you know、uh, Taiwanese American activities、uh, and、um, in back in college, and that's how we met.、Um, and since then, he has um, some. Um, He will have some experiences that we can sort of talk about and、uh, share with other people, share with you guys.、Um, so without, so this program is、um, set up so we are kind of、um, in a. So I will be asking some questions and Kevin will be sharing.、Um, if anybody has any questions or any ideas, you know, don't be shy to raise your hand and then、uh, let's just keep this a very open conversation.、Um, so without further ado, let's get started. All right. So I think a lot of people are interested.、Um, you know, I for Kevin, I think、um, everybody here knows that.、Um, I mean, as I mentioned, he was CEO of Twitch, and that Twitch was、uh, acquired by Amazon for、um, close to one billion dollars. I think it was two years ago.、Um, almost. Almost two years. Yesterday. Feels like yesterday. <laughs>、um, so, how did、um, you know a seemingly normal Taiwanese kid like you,、um, you know, get into like get to where you are today as a you know tech industry almost celebrity, if you will?、Um, so, how did that happen? Like, what happened in between? Sure. So I should preface this all with the fact that my mom and dad are in the room, so I have to be really careful with what I say. What will your friend happen? So how did it happen?、Um, I'd be lying if I said it was deliberate.、Uh, I think, like most、uh, kids that grew up around our age.、Um, We were sort of expected to go to grad school, in all likelihood medical school or law school or business school,、um, and I did none of those things. So, how many parents out there as kids are doctors? <laughs> Come on! I know you're very proud of the fact that you have kids who are doctors, right? Okay, there, there's quite. So,、uh, I didn't know. I had no idea. My brother was in tech. Uh, back in 1990, well, in the late 90s, he kind of rode the boom, ended up at Yahoo, left right around 2001, left the Bay Area, and I thought I'd never really get into it.、Um, I studied ecology and evolutionary biology in college,、um, none of which I use today.、Uh, my excuse was I was going to go be a veterinarian.、Um, I didn't become a veterinarian, which is a.、Uh, I think my mom was okay with that because she's like, oh, it's basically a doctor. <laughs>、um, <laughs> 
Um, so I went, I moved to New York after college, uh, didn't really have a plan, started working for some event planning companies doing just random production work around the city. Eventually got hired by the government, worked for New York City government, which taught me all about bureaucracy and how to deal with terrible corporate environments, um, which helped me later. Uh, you sort of throw, uh, grow a really thick skin from that. Then after that, my brother invented this thing called Lamp Buddy, which is, uh, back in the early 2000s, there were these really popular lamps that you could buy at Bed Bath & Beyond or Sam's Club or Costco that were just poles with a bowl on the top. And they were setting houses on fire. I don't know if you guys remember that. It's not a very good technology. But they were kind of useless because they were just, they took up a lot of floor space um, and just basically were lamps. And so he invented this table that you could attach to that. And so my, I started working my, with my brother in Boston on that. Um, oh, I need to get closer. Okay. So I started working with my brother on that. Um, first sort of experience with a startup, so to speak. We didn't really. We didn't actually build a business, it was kind of a farce. Um, we ended up selling the rights to Bed Bath & Beyond and they were theoretically supposed to actually create it and distribute it in their stores, but they never did. Um, so we had kind of a bad taste in our mouth from that. But through that, I joined this company called Adina, which was a beverage company. Um, and then that's what actually resulted in me coming out to San Francisco. And I came out to San Francisco for this startup. Uh, we bought, they bought a company just as I was moving to San Francisco, which was a beverage distribution company. So uh, I ended up working in a warehouse, uh, moving beverages, like 40 pound cases of beverages, glass bottles. Uh, I drove a forklift, I drove trucks. I delivered, I delivered to stores around the Bay Area. Like it's not a very glor glorified thing to do, um, but learned a lot just running the warehouse. Um, we had like an old shipping container that, I, that we built a tiny little office in. It was cold, it was right next to the ballpark. So that, that, just to interject, that actually sounds very Taiwanese to me, <laughs> to have an office in a cargo container. It's very, it's very efficient right. and cheap. Um, that just reminds me of Taiwan, sorry. Yeah. So all of this was very not deliberate. And all the while, my parents were like, please, for the love of God, go back to school. Like, study anything. Business school, you name it. Um, and then eventually, I started drifting. I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know if I wanted to continue in the beverage industry. I didn't know... If I wanted to go back to school, I studied for the GMAT and took it just to get it out of the way. I studied for the GRE and took it just to get it out of the way. And then eventually my friends, my crazy friends from college, decided to drive across, uh, well, I should say, three of them got together. Justin, Michael, and Emmett. I knew Michael and Justin in college. And they drove across the country after Justin and Emmett sold their first startup on eBay. Uh, it's probably still the first and only company to be sold on eBay. Um, but it was like a calendaring company, so if anybody uses Google Calendar, it was basically that, and they sold it for $250,000 in an auction to another business. Um, very bold and weird and sort of a sign of the things to come. They drove across the country, and I was out here, so I uh, met up with them, and they told me they had this crazy idea about starting a business uh, where Justin would stream his life 24-7. So like Truman Show, Ed TV, if you've ever seen stuff like that, essentially turning himself into reality television. And I just looked at them and I was like, that is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. Like, that's, that's not gonna work. Just to explain a little bit, it involves uh, basically being imagine this, his friend Justin putting a camera to him, pointing a camera to himself and walking around. And walking around and going to the bathroom and watching TV. It was the most boring thing. <laughs> and for 24 7, like all the time, and somebody was supposed to be watching this, right? Yeah. So somehow they raised money on this idea. Um, which was probably, a, I mean, this, this was in 2006 they raised money, 2006, 2007. Just as, like, you know, the market was starting to bounce back. Um, so they raised a little bit of money, uh, they built this device um, to help him actually walk around San Francisco and stream. Back then it was all EVBO, it was not 4G, it wasn't even 3G yet, so it was really hard to get a video signal to the internet and then replicate it around the world. So luckily, the investors, who were clearly way smarter than these guys were back then, saw, ah, it's not really a reality show, they actually had to build this live stream video technology um, to relay you know, uh, small packets of information around the world as quickly as possible. And so they turned that tech into what became Justin TV, um, the platform, and that, that was when YouTube was really growing. So then YouTube got bought by Google, and we were like, great, we're onto something. We're gonna call ourselves YouTube, but live, because YouTube was on demand viewing. And so we focused on that, we grew the platform, it grew really quickly, 
Um, and we got to 60, 70 million uh, viewers every single month. So pretty decently sized platform for, for video content. And got really bored. We didn't like it, we didn't care for it really. We didn't use our own platform. We didn't use our own product. Um, but luckily we were profitable, so the board trusted us to come up with new crazy ideas. And at the time, uh, StarCraft II came out, uh, which was a video game made by Blizzard. And we got the beta early, and our productivity went completely down the drain. We were just playing this game constantly all day. And we realized that people were creating content around this game on YouTube and on other platforms. And it was interesting. You watch other people play video games, which probably sounds to most of you in the room like, why would anyone ever do that? Um, but the because, fact is, because it's it's already such a waste of time to be playing video games. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if you if you are only watching other people play video games, <laughs> yeah, it's even worse. Right? It's even worse. Right? Um, turns out playing games is good for you. So I'm proof of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I played a lot of games as a kid. My mom and dad hated it. Uh, uh, really, it was like my aunt and uncles that would give me consoles, and they'd be like, why are you giving Kevin consoles? Like, we don't even get them for him. Uh, well, I had a Nintendo. Um, but, so, we, as we were playing this game, we realized, like, hey, there's probably a market for this. We can't possibly be the only people that want to watch other people play video games from wherever you are. Um, and our board sort of scratched our heads and said, you guys are crazy. Um, but we proved it, we, we did a bunch of research, found out that it was actually a really growing uh, phenomenon on YouTube. Uh, so a lot of kids were watching like Minecraft videos, but the secret is it's actually really about the personality. It's not as much about watching the video game, it's just selecting an individual as an entertainer. And so we've managed to get the plan by the board, and we told them, you know, give us six months. Um, if we hit our numbers, we'd love to just completely pivot the company into this thing that eventually became Twitch. And so we hit our numbers, we blew our numbers out of the water within two months. Um, so we just hit the ground running, raised a little bit more money, and, and kept going. And so what it's become is this you know, giant platform that we had 100 million people that watch video game content every single month. Uh, there's pro players, this uh, new phenomenon that's come up called eSports. It's not actually that new, it's about 15 years old. But it's competitive video game play. And there are kids around the world now that participate in tournaments for millions of dollars. Uh, there's a tournament coming up in August that every year the tournament prizing has grown from 1 million to 3 million to 6 million to 10 million to 18 million. It's already at 18 million this year, and so we predict that it'll get to like 22, 23 million by the time the tournament happens in August. And so, you know, groups of five kids are getting together and playing, and someone's going to walk away a millionaire, essentially. And uh, not only that, there are thousands of people that actually make a living on the platform just by playing video games. And it's not as easy as that. You have to be a personality. You have to actually entertain your audience. And so this whole concept of like democratization of content creation, we sort of do it on the live video side, where Twitter is more on the sort of synchronous tech side, Facebook kind of on the more social asynchronous side, YouTube on the VOD on demand side. Um, we're sort of leading the live video piece of that. Um, yeah, and actually, um, just people have an idea in comparison how uh, how many people watch Twitch versus say watch like CNN or yeah. Uh, ah, yeah. So we're bigger than most TV channels. So to give you an idea, we are the number four um, number four website in the United States in terms of traffic at any given moment, um, which no one knows about us, which is a hilarious thing. So you like imagine, okay, who pushes a lot of bits around the internet? Hulu, Netflix, Apple. Google. Well, we're actually, we were actually bigger than Amazon, bigger than Hulu when we got acquired. Uh, and that's actually the same case across the world. So Brazil, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, most of Western Europe, much of Eastern Europe, um, we're actually a top five website. Again, a top five website that no one actually knows about, which is weird. Um, uh, so in and Taipei, I was actually there in October talking to a bunch of startups out there. Uh, Taipei is actually a number one city. Um, by traffic, and we have about four and a half to five million people from Taiwan that visit our site every single month, um, which is about you know almost a quarter of the population of Taiwan. Um, so it's a pretty big phenomenon there. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, there's this game called League of Legends, which is one of the biggest games in the world. I think 120 million people play it. And at one of the early tournaments uh, that League of Legends had, a Taipei-based team won. Uh, they were called the Taipei Assassins. They're not owned by Jay Chow, the pop star. 
No, nobody so was Jay Chat. So Jay Lee. Yeah. So they, they, he bought that team, um, but they won, and they were received back at the Taipei airport like celebrities. Like it was described as if they were like the Beatles. They arrived at the airport, and there were thousands of people waiting outside, cheering them on, hoping to shake their hands, hoping to take pictures with them, and it really set Taiwan on the map internationally in the game world. Traditionally, Chinese teams are the strongest, or Korean teams are the strongest, and for the first time, a Taipei team actually beat everyone. Uh, completely unexpected. And because of that, uh, the Ty Taiwan government actually now recognizes what they call esports athletes, esports players, pro players, uh, as athletes, so they can get visas to travel internationally to, to play. And Taiwan's actually leading there. So they were probably the third nation to do so. Italy did it. Um, I think Vietnam did it, and then, and then Taiwan did it. The United States hasn't even done it yet. Germany hasn't even done it yet. And these are, you know, there are lots and lots of pro players that are coming from those countries. Um, so in that sense, Taiwan was pretty progressive there. Okay, so <clears throat> before we talk more about kids playing video games and winning millions of dollars, and then having, giving all of you guys nightmares without poor parents, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, why we're here today, right? So Taiwanese American community uh, involvement. I know um, most of what we see, uh, people that we see here, are um, you know our uh, people with our parents or you know etc. But how? Um, well, Kevin, you grew up in an area where there's you know lots of Taiwanese people, uh, so it's of course natural for you to get involved with Taiwanese students, you know, activities and things, right? Uh, not not really. So I grew up in Louisiana. Um, I guess we ended up there because Dad got a job at University of New Orleans as a professor of electrical engineering. And there was a small, tight-knit Taiwanese community. So they did the Hoya stuff, right? So we all got together, probably 40 families maybe, 30, 40 families. Um, but pretty tight-knit group. But everyone else, you know, it's like New Orleans was actually, as I was growing up there, 65% African-American, pretty much remainder Caucasian. Um, so it wasn't there were very, yeah, there weren't very many Asian Americans there. And the school I went to was a um, all boys Catholic school of like the 1,300 students there. There were like four Asians, um, so it kind of sucked. I didn't like growing up there, honestly. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of fun. Um, I skipped a lot of class. They could have kicked me out, but they thought I'd end up at an Ivy League. So but your parents know that out. now, right? They know that now. Oh, okay. Well, so <laughs> the they know that my brother actually suffered through that same school all the way to graduation. He ended up going to Harvard. Um, but he hated it, and he never went back to Louisiana until this past year. <laughs> so like, he's so my brother's 14 years older than I am, um, and I go back to Louisiana all the time, obviously. But uh, he went back last year for the first time in 20 years, 30 years, first time in 30 years. So that's how bad his experience was. Um, my experience was a little bit better because I ended up going to a boarding school in northwestern Louisiana, which was just like a junior and senior year magnet school, like a government-funded math and science school. And it was just a much better place. So my experience wasn't as bad. But yeah, growing up was not, it wasn't great. I, I skipped a lot of class. They couldn't kick me out, but um, I, you know, they, they left me enrolled. Um, I think I had a chance at Redemption. They asked me to go to the Mu Alpha Theta competition because they thought they would win if I went. And I decided not to go because I think it was my birthday or something. I was like, I don't know. Like um, but you made it to you made it to Yale. I ended up going to Yale for undergrad. Um, I actually wasn't even gonna apply to Yale. My my first guidance counselor at my boarding school was basically like, yeah, you should probably just go to LSU or Tulane or something like that. My parents were like, no, you're applying to every single Ivy League. Um, so uh, my my I switched guidance counselors, and uh, her name was uh, Joanna Forrest. She said, hey, you should pro probably apply to Yale. Like, we think you'd actually like it there. And I was like, what's Yale? <laughs> and then she's like, it's a, it's a really good school. And I was like, OK. She's like, and it's in New Haven, Connecticut. And I was like, what's New Haven, Connecticut? Um, so I, t I literally knew nothing about it. But thanks to her, I applied and got in. My brother was, you know, I asked my brother at the time where I had to make a decision. And he was like, you should just go to Yale. Like, don't. He's like, you wouldn't like it anywhere else because he spent a lot of time there. I mean, he went to Harvard, spent a lot of time at Yale and Brown and, and so on, and he, fit, he thought for my personality that uh, Yale would be a better fit. Um, I honestly think college, to be frank, you kind of just get whatever experience you get out of it. Um, what, it. It depends on how deliberate you are about it, right? I didn't actually do great academically, but I did a ton of extracurriculars. 
Um, so I met a lot of people, grew a big network. I didn't even realize I was doing it at the time. It was just a nice distraction from class. Um, so that's another sort of non-deliberate thing that I did. Uh, that's, that's when you got into um, the Taiwanese American Students Organization on campus at Yale, mm -hmm. um, and then get, got into the ICASA. Right? Yeah. So there was nothing deliberate about that. It wasn't because, uh, I mean, how did you choose to get into that, or how did you get into that yeah. um, amongst you know, all the different extracurricular activities that probably would have been a you know, more interesting distraction for you? Yeah. How did I get into it? Um, I think I went to a meeting my freshman year, and people were just really nice. And it was as simple as that. I was like really shy, and people were very friendly, and um, it just felt kind of warm uh, versus a lot of the other groups that were, I don't know, more like, you know, why do you think you deserve to be at this club kind of thing. It was just a very warm, welcoming community, and obviously, uh, I grew up only speaking Taiwanese, which is weird. I don't speak Chinese at all. Um, so when I go back to Taiwan, I insist that people speak Taiwanese. They look at me like I'm some anomaly. Uh, I think they basically say, you're really geek. Like, like, <laughs> I hear that a lot when I'm in Taiwan. Um, so it just was, I don't know, natural. It wasn't really like a very conscious decision. I just kept going back because they were really friendly and they started doing like Taiwan, Taiwanese dinner tables where they speak Taiwanese and it was just a nice place to go. And then I went to Etasa um, at Harvard 2000. 2000. 2000. 2001. Two. Was it 2002? Yeah. Okay. And then I met Ting and uh, DK and so on, and well, we got to know each other better there. Um, it was a ton of fun, and then we decided to organize one for 2004, which was my senior year, which was a huge mistake in retrospect. Like, organizing something that big senior year was a, a bad thing. Um, but it was a huge toss that we had like 600 people that came. We spent way more money than we should have. Um, learned how to fundraise from that, basically. Uh, so yeah, I think it was it was more just how welcoming the community was, and just that I just subconsciously cared a lot about being Taiwanese, having that identity. And it, like Taiwanese identity, I, I think of it a lot like like New Orleans. Like New Orleans is a very distinct identity from the South. Right? A lot of people will say like I'm Southern. I actually don't say I'm Southern. I say I'm from New Orleans because New Orleans is a very different kind of place. It's more of a cultural melting pot. Um, despite just being in the South, I guess just like you'd say you're from the Bay Area versus California. To me, Taiwanese is like such a unique thing and, um, that has stood out and it just, people in college be like, well, you're just Chinese, right? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm Taiwanese. Not to say it politically, just like to be correct. Like actually my parents are from Taiwan. I speak a language called Taiwanese. I don't identify necessarily as just broadly Chinese. Um, so it wasn't like being, like, act, like, like I said, not being political. It's just, I felt it was accurate to say that. Um, and so yeah. And, uh, but then after college, um, did you, um, I guess, did you continue with, uh, how did you continue, or you know, how did you now continue with your involvement with the Taiwanese American community, yeah. um, and sort of like, what, like why that happened? Yeah, uh, I, get, I didn't really stay involved, unfortunately. Um, I helped with Itasa afterwards for a little while, on uh, uh, being on the board. But then I moved to New York and I was just like desperately trying to find a job and figure out an excuse to give my parents as to why I was in New York. Um, so I didn't really stay that involved. And then I moved to Boston for six months and didn't really do a lot there in, in the Taiwanese American community. Got out to San Francisco and the first year I was here I was much less busy because I was, well, I was working like from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. driving trucks and forklifts and I didn't have to think about anything about work afterwards. It's very different now, unfortunately. Um, so I was trying to get a little bit involved then, but I just, you know, got distracted, honestly. And, and it, again, not by any, any deliberate means, it just became less, frankly, less important uh, at the time because I was trying to figure out what my career would look like and um, what I was going to do and whether or not I was going to go back to school and, you know, how I was going to make money. Um, and that, was, that became kind of overbearing and, and a lot of extracurriculars dropped. Uh, as a result, I stopped playing tennis, I stopped playing piano, like all that stuff just kind of went away. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't because I didn't want to be involved, it just happens. And I think it happens to a lot of folks, especially as now I reconnect with people from college, that second generation, you know, once you start your careers, it's really, really hard to stay involved and active and, and, and really even think about it. Um, and so, I guess this, this question is a little bit more, um, I don't want to say like what advice or you know, sort of from your own personal experience, um, 
why would you say, like, how would you say, you know, people in our generation? And um, I'm thinking maybe um, some of, you know, our friends or our, you know, children in the room, right? Like, how do we, like, why, what would you tell them is, you know, like, why is it important or why should they think about getting involved with the Taiwanese community or being more aware of what's going on, you know, with Taiwan or with, uh, you know, Taiwanese Americans? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, community in general, like, culture is a big part of that, right? So that shared culture is a great way for folks to connect, and it's a good icebreaker, it's a nice thing to have um, and, and be active about. I think Taiwan's in a pretty unique place right now, and, and it's important for folks that care about it to connect. Um, if for no other reason, I mean, there's lots of different reasons, right? So you think about from a professional perspective, there are lots of very successful Taiwanese Americans, uh, second generation, that are CEOs of companies, founders of companies, or very, you know, successful executives of larger companies, and it's a good network to tap into, if nothing else. And again, like that, that connection, that natural connection, people are always looking for that, right? Whether that's like finding someone that grew up in your hometown, finding someone that has similar hobbies, um, people will try to attempt to connect in, in, in many different ways, um, but cultural connection is probably one of the deepest ones. Um, it feels like family, right? And I think that's a great way to just help you find yourself, help you find your career, help you share ideas, whether it's about politics, whether it's about industry, whether it's about just community building. Um, it's a nice natural thing to latch on to. And uh, I think it helps people just stay actively thoughtful as well about what's going on in um, in the world around you. Um, helps you sort through identity things that you grew up with, right? Why did, as I grew up, you know, why was I always so insistent about being called Taiwanese and not something else? Or not just being generic, be lumped into Asian America. And as I think more and more about what I do at work, um, a lot of what we do is very global. And I think there's an opportunity to actually give, especially in America, where races tend to just get lumped together. Um, and that's kind of a shame. But there's, it's, it's twofold, right? For Asian American causes to be pushed forward, Asian Americans really do have to come together despite our different species, so to speak, uh, to push forward that larger initiative. And I think only once you start push, pushing a larger initiative forward and being more heard can the individual voices be heard. Um, and that's what's really fascinating about the work that we do, that I get to do, is thinking about how do you highlight each country's heroes? How do you, you we have a very, you know, very real opportunity to do that. And the more, the more deeply you are connected as an individual to a, a core community, the more you can think about, you know, what are the, what are the ways that you can elevate a message um, through different means, different media? Uh, how do you affect the way people think about you and the things you care about and, and your culture in a different way. And a lot of that is about being connected with not only the folks in your own community, but you know, in many different communities. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's one of the probably stronger reasons to stay connected um, is to be able to further that message. Yeah. That's actually very interesting. Just wanted to kind of comment a little bit because um, especially on the English side of the program, um, today we talk a lot about Taiwanese American history um, you know, the history of the different generations of, you know, Taiwanese American activism. And there's always this question of um, <clears throat> how do we build our community? How do we get more people involved? And I think a lot of us, including myself, have been thinking in terms of, well, how do we attract them by looking for something that's useful to them, right? Like, um, you know, or something that's flashy and interesting to them. And I think one of the things that I haven't I would admit that I have not thought about is this, yeah, it feels like family, it's familiar, it's warm, like you said, right? Um, something where that's something that nobody else can offer us but the people in this room. Um, so I think that's actually something that's very powerful and that I actually haven't thought of. So um, I guess one uh, final question uh, from me is, um, you mentioned that you were in Taiwan recently, and I know you travel to Taiwan often for work. Um, has, um, you know, tell us a little bit about that, and also, um, 
you know, how, uh, what kind of Taiwan ac you know, related activities, either in your career or personally, are you involved with right now? Um, yeah, sure. So I went to Taiwan in October. Uh, essentially, this like entrepreneur program, I guess. They just wanted to bring um, international entrepreneurs to teach, or at least meet. I don't know if I taught anybody anything. Hopefully, I did. Um, at least meet a bunch of the entrepreneurs in Taiwan and uh, help them understand how we do business out west and also try to identify what might be happening in Taiwan that prevents the startup scene from going growing faster. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was weird, it's different. Like the press stuff there, I don't really, I don't know. I'm standing in front of you right now. I'm actually pretty, pretty bashful. Um, so when we went out there, we met with a couple of the accelerators. There's an accelerator called AppWorks and there are a few others and met a bunch of their uh, startups and tried to understand what their struggles were. And what's really fascinating about the Taiwan startup market is like you hear a lot about pivoting out here where one company will start with one idea and switch to another, just like we did. Um, there, they switched from one idea to an entirely different one. So as an example, there was a, a company that was trying to start an e-commerce site for senior citizens and ended up pivoting, I think, to a milk delivery service. <laughs> and then another one that started as like a fine tea website, discovery website, that changed to a salad delivery service. Delivery was a kind of a common theme. Um, so it's very random what happens there, and I think a lot of it is a couple things. I mean, if you think about some of the biggest companies in the world, most recognizable companies in the world are actually from Taiwan. You look at Giant Bicycles, you look at Garmin, you look at Nvidia. I mean, there's tons of companies that are that are from from Taiwan that people don't even realize, um, and thus there's a kind of a brain trust of mentors that a lot of the current startups aren't tapping into. I think it's somewhat, I don't know, maybe it's because it's a hardware versus software mentality. I'm not really sure what it is. That that's one major problem. There's no mentorship out there. They also don't think very globally. They think hyper hyper locally to Taiwan, which at the end of the day is only 24 million people. It's not a big big market. If you want to grow a giant business, you have to think really further than that. Um, realizing also that thinking directly to China is also a tough market, regulatorily hard to do, um, and like rife with copycatting, so probably not the best. So then thinking, how do you think about the Western market? How do you create products that also eventually, as they grow, are relevant to the Western market? Thirdly, there's not a whole lot of funding out there. Um, and fourthly, oddly, this was the weirdest one that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around, Maybe, and maybe you guys can help me understand this, is it doesn't seem like people there like collaborating. Which is strange, because as I grew up thinking about our, our own community in, in New Orleans, I mean, the fact that they did the Hoya meant we were collaborating. People were taking the risk of giving essentially a stranger money, or someone they were just getting to know money to start a business, whether it was to buy a truck to, to start your business, or to put a loan on, on, on a restaurant, or, or whatever the case may be. There, were a lot, there was a lot of risk taking, and I, and I interpreted that as collaboration. Um, but it seemed like a lot of the entrepreneurs there, well, while they'd share ideas, it was very much like, it was either arrogance or, or it might have been more, people didn't want to have to be reliant on other people. And, and that may be either, again, arrogance or it might be guilt. And I think a little bit of it, and I'm guilty of this a lot, is at work, I will do extra work and I will stay late because I don't want to put the burden on someone else. And what I realized later in my career was I wasn't, I was now putting the burden on myself and I wasn't giving another person a chance to learn and grow. And that was the hardest thing for me to learn as we grew the business was to people would describe it as delegation. And it wasn't until I realized it wasn't about delegation, it was really about challenging people and giving them the opportunity to work with you, to learn, to grow um, as, as their own person. And it seems like entrepreneurs in, in Taiwan resist that as well within their own teams. They rather, rather than handing the work off to a subordinate or a report or whatever, um, tend, to, tend to just try and do it themselves because they know they can do it, they know they're capable of it. Um, and I think that actually uh, results in a lot of resistance of, of growth of a lot of those businesses because the people at the top, those smart entrepreneurs that are trying to innovate end up doing too much of the nitty gritty. Um, but that's you know something I talked to a lot, continue to talk to several of the entrepreneurs I met out in Taiwan about to try to understand like what is the cultural reason for that right why is that that as you dig and actually interview these entrepreneurs there and try to understand what their struggles are it comes down to this core problem 
uh, well, I feel like I'm collaborating with my neighbor. Like another company and I will share ideas, we'll share best practices. But then internally, we can't seem to grow the company fast enough. And I originally thought it was sort of the former three issues, which is mentorship, lack of mentorship, lack of funding, and, and sort of lack of like grand vision for global business. But I think it actually is deeper than that. Um, and I think that's something I hope someone does some research on and figures out because I think that's kind of one of those cultural, very hard to understand cultural psychologies that is preventing faster growth uh, in the internet phase. Like hardware is one of those things, you sell it, right? You make it, if you make the best piece of hardware, everyone around the world is going to want to buy it from you. Software is much harder because the margin, uh, the barrier to entry is tiny, almost, virtually zero for most companies. Um, and I think that's what's sort of stifling that, that local innovation. So, um, because of the time uh, constraint, um, why don't we, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'll take maybe about uh, three questions, and then we'll have, uh, you know, have Ke uh, Kevin answer them. You can, you can say your question in any language you prefer, uh, and since Kevin understands Taiwanese, and. Mostly. Mostly? Okay. <laughs> Wait, you can, I'll, you can ask me. Tingle Trans. Um, or you can say it in English. So, does anybody have anything they would like to ask? Question, the question is, um, how did you personally get over the hurdle of um, you know, being able to ask people for help and to ask uh, to you know, delegate or to challenge other people? Right. Um, I don't know if there was like a specific moment. Uh, I think it's something that people end up, you know, we had, a, we had a great board of directors for our company and they would constantly tell us, find, find mentors. Like you need to find a good mentor. And it might not be the type of mentor that you expect. Like a lot of people look to mentors of exactly the thing they want to replicate. So a lot of folks will say, okay, I'm an entrepreneur in tech. I will find a successful tech entrepreneur that I respect and beg them to be my mentor. Sometimes it's not really that. Like a lot of the mentorship I got was really around like people management. How do you understand how people think in, an, in a work environment? And how do you figure out those classic three things that everyone says in every like corporate book, which is mastery, autonomy, and purpose? And how do you actually embrace that and learn that yourself so that you can figure out how to translate to other people? I think really like the way I figured it out was I just kind of, you break every once in a while as a person, right? And, and as a, whether you're challenging yourself intellectually, academically, or you're doing research, or you're starting a company, or you're trying to climb the ranks of a corporate ladder, if you're really ambitious, you'll continue to work as hard as possible. And then you'll hit a peak. And then you hit that peak and then you crash. And that crash is not a negative thing. It just means either you've hit a crash and you can't learn anymore in, in terms of the thing that you're doing, um, or you're just burnt out, or you actually don't know what to do anymore. And that's when you have to like really look within and, and, and find what the next thing's gonna be for you. And I think I found that by talking to people within the company, right? People that I trusted and respected that either worked for me or worked for someone else in the company. We'd just sit around and think about new ideas. And that's what, I think that's what really taught me, oh, actually all these people that we've hired, all these people that are you know, surrounding us are, are quite intelligent, quite capable of doing things. Um, and then our culture shifted dramatically to a culture of, well, we always debated a lot, um, which scared a lot of people because we'd actually kind of yell at each other. Um, but it was very friendly, and as soon as the conversation was over, we were back to friends. Um, but for a lot of new people that didn't expect that, that was really jarring. And once people learned that, and once we learned from people that they actually wanted to share ideas, that they cared a lot about what we were doing, we sort of just empowered them to, to create new ideas. So we have this culture of if you have, we have an open office, anyone can come to anybody in the office and, and talk to them um, without being annoying, because sometimes it gets really, it's hard to work sometimes in an open office, as we learned later. Um, but 
But that was sort of the spirit of it is you got an idea, come talk to us, challenge us. Like any executive should be challenged. If you as a junior level employee feel like an executive made a bad decision, you should be able to go to that executive and say, hey, I, here, here's a better way to do it, or here's my suggestion, or why, you know, explain to me why you're doing it this way. And that's what really opened, it, opened up the opportunity for us to say, okay, this guy's got a really great idea, we're gonna put a whole team behind him. Um, you know, that's what we would, would do. And it, it took a long time to figure that out, but it took a lot of just self-acceptance that sometimes you can't do something anymore, um, that you might have hit a peak, and it might be temporary. But as you hit that peak, you have to figure out, okay, is it something you can just punch through yourself, or do you need help? And, and by help, it's not necessarily you know, help in the sense of like, help me, I can't do this anymore. It's just, all right, I need other folks to focus on this stuff so that I can do something different. Um, but it really just takes, a lot of people burn out, and they just burn out. Um, but you have to identify when that's about to happen and figure out why it's happening, um, and then you can really get through that. I mean, it sounds like working at Twitch actually sounds like my previous job uh, working at the law firm. Um, there was an open office where the partner can always walk into the office at any time. There was a lot of yelling. Uh, but the only difference is I cannot tell my boss what he's doing wrong. So. Uh, what kind of arrangement do you have with investors regarding profit What kind of arrangement do we have with investors? Well, uh, we got bought by Amazon, so no, the they take all of our profit. No, the stock. <laughs> when oh, when we started? Yeah, yeah. Ah, um, no profit <coughs> share, actually. I mean, most of the Silicon Valley investments are just equity investments, right? And um, I think for us, we, and, you know, we probably had some, I mean, it, it's probably presumed that if you become profitable as a startup that um, you, you should share percentage-wise with the equity holders, but our investors were like, look, if you guys actually start making money, we just want you to reinvest everything. They didn't take any money off the top. So as soon as we hit profit, they're like, just go, just keep, keep reinvesting, grow faster. And that's a general mentality of most Silicon Valley VCs, is they want most of their companies to do that. Now, unfortunately for them, the great majority of companies never make profit, um, so that's never a problem for them to think about. Um, but the hope is, the great hope is that companies become profitable. Uh, but like I said, I think 90, probably 99% of VCs, the smart ones, just want you to reinvest the money. Uh, so uh, we have one last question. Okay, so the question is how uh, that awkward question every entrepreneur is like awkwardly thinking about is how did you do it? How did you become successful and what can you teach other people? Um, I don't know. I mean, I was really not deliberate in life. I, I didn't really even think about from high school graduation on what I was going to do. Um, I went to New York without a plan, without a job. I moved to Boston to work with my brother on this silly startup idea. Moved to San Francisco basically on a whim for a beverage company in an industry I didn't even understand. When I joined Justin TV, I told the guys, I'm like, look, there are thousands of people more qualified than I am to do the job that you need, which was they asked me to help them raise money. Um, and I, I wasn't super deliberate about it. Now, the things that I've learned, uh, grit is a very real thing. Call it perseverance, call it persistence, call it stubbornness. You have to just have grit. You have to be able to suffer through everything bad because everything is always bad. Um, and just find that silver lining constantly. And you're iterating on that process and repeating it over and over and over again. Um, finding a great mentor. You absolutely have to find a good mentor. And, and oftentimes it's many. Oftentimes you'll have many mentors. And again, I think actually the first step to be, before you find a mentor is you have to be really self-aware. You have to accept the fact that you are imperfect, despite what your mom and dad might tell you, um, and that kind of you suck at a lot of things. And how do you figure out the things that you need to learn in order to grow? And that's the, those are the types of mentors you need to find. Like for instance, for me, um, I didn't know how to make money on the internet at all. I didn't even know what cost structures were like. I didn't know how to do anything on the internet. So I had to find a bunch of people who could teach me that specifically. And now that's a very like quantitative thing you can learn. 
then after that, it was all the soft skills, figuring out how to manage people. What was like the social psychology of an office? Like, how do you, you know, what is tribe mentality like? And then, then you're finding different people that have dealt with that in a unique way. Um, and then it's just surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you. I think a lot of people say that. It sounds really cliche and cheesy, but it's true. It's like if you end up hiring people that aren't better than you, then you will never grow yourself. And you have to not be afraid of being challenged by the people you hire, because then you end up pushing each other. Um, what else is there? Learn how to fundraise, I guess? I mean, that's not an easy thing. Uh, it's all about creating a market for yourself as quickly as humanly possible. And you're kind of telling a few white lies every now and then, and you just have to be okay with that. Um, and then it's just about sort of cleverness, right? Like we were not, we were, there were many times in our company where we were about to close the doors. And we had to either think about very clever ways to convince our vendors that we didn't in fact have to pay our bills, um, or find money somewhere. And that was, you know, that goes back to sort of the persistence thing. Um, but there's a lot of clever ways, and it turns out, like, if you're nice to people, and you treat them the way that you want to be treated, even if you owe them a million dollars, they might not give you a hard time for a little while. And that was one of those weird things that I learned where, I mean, you know, New Orleans is, and, and I think Chinese people in general, very kind, generous people, and very much about your neighbor. Like, you care about what the people around you are doing, you care about their well-being, you care about their welfare. Um, and so as I went to market, like, I, I argued with Michael, who was our original CEO, a lot about, well, why do you even talk to these people? Why do you care? Like, they're not high up at a big company. Why do you even give them the time of day? And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's just like, interesting. I learned from them. They learned from me, and we keep in touch, and who knows? Maybe one day they're gonna be the CEO of some great company. You don't know. And so a lot of it is really just treating, you know, treating people well. And, and, and if you do a good job of that, people will treat you well and hope that you succeed. Um, so there's no one formula. I mean, I know, you know, plenty of great entrepreneurs that didn't go to an Ivy League and that didn't even go to college. Um, but I think there's some core things, like the things that I mentioned that are there. It's a willingness to learn, a willingness to, a willingness to particularly learn about yourself, um, and a willingness to seek for help. And uh, persistence and grit, and just refusing to lose. So uh, as uh, the moderator, I'm going to take my prerogative and ask the last silly question for all of our, and this is something we have not discussed, uh, for all of our parents and grandparents out there. Um, <clears throat> if they were to buy a video game for their kids right now, uh, what would you recommend? That's an impossible question. I don't know, Overwatch is pretty good. Actually, uh, Yaming. Question? Yes. Um, before you answer that question, uh, because you were asking questions about working here and working in Taiwan, and you had a big puzzle, a big question, a big, yeah, about why they don't learn, they don't ask questions, why uh, there's no breakthrough. Sort of, you know, um, there's something that's holding people in Taiwan back from breaking through, or from becoming learning more, or becoming more creative. And I was thinking about, and I think the older generation and maybe younger generation were kind of similar situation, or uh, American culture and or Western culture and Eastern culture. Uh, the differences in, in culture and the, the behavior and the achievement or the individual breakthrough and achievement. And it, you use that very key words. Uh, it's open, it's okay to ask questions. Uh, you can learn more from people who are smarter than you are. But then in some other cultures, it's very close. You don't ask questions because you don't want to lose your face. You don't want people to know that you don't know the question, the answer. And therefore, you are you push yourself from growing and learning and becoming. You know, you get the breakthrough and you achieve bigger things. And you also don't want to share with other people because you want to keep a credit. To yourself. And so the big difference is making 
sort of showing the different ways of how things work and how things flow. Yeah, I think they just need to reach out and connect, right? And there's a bunch of groups that are trying to do that now, so I hope... You mean right now in Taiwan? That's right, yeah. There's like a Silicon Valley group um, that's trying to be conscious about offering their time to Taiwanese entrepreneurs in Taiwan. So that bridge hopefully gets built, right? But it's not just the group here. I mean, you can learn from anybody. It doesn't have to be from any group from Taiwanese people. Uh, but I think if, if, if the Chinese Americans are conscious about it, that'll help. That'll be a good start. Yeah, if they can so, break through the skin, <coughs> this kind of thing that's holding so them So actually, back. Uh, because of the time constraint, I'm going to end this program here. Can we first give a big round of applause? And as uh, the uh, tradition goes, we always have a gift for our speakers. Um, and so, so uh, we're going to present this, uh, just a little uh, token of our appreciation to Kevin. I know he's extremely busy uh, for him to come out and talk to us on a Saturday night, so really appreciate it.